Thank you very much, uh, Rob. I appreciate the opportunity to share God's word with you tonight. It's indeed a privilege of privileges. Well, as Rob mentioned, uh, tonight we will look at a topic, probably something you don't think about a lot, but uh, uh, I entitled this uh, Choice Between Good and Best, Motive of Heart. I've uh, thought about a few things that I want to read. Uh, I didn't memorize uh, this first part, but I want to read it carefully and slowly so you, you kind of get the gist of where we're going to go tonight. But we're going to look at the topic of, of motive. Uh, we'll look at proper motives, uh, some improper motives, things that are recorded in God's Word. We'll look at the meaning of, of motives, uh, and we'll see what other translations, uh, what words are used instead of motives. And then we'll look at why motives matter to us. So, as mature followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not always choosing between good and evil. Many times in life, we are choosing between good and best. This presentation is not intended to result in second-guessing our thoughts and decisions, but rather to check the pulse of our heart and help make sure that our decisions are the proper thing for a given situation, not just similar situations that we're comfortable with, but what I am doing now and why I'm doing it. We are daily, if not hourly, almost without thinking, choosing between good and best. Choices or decisions can easily be challenged to choose the most familiar path, almost without thought, choosing by default. For me, this can result in choosing or deciding something really without bouncing my decisions and to check it uh, to see what is the best choice or reason for my decision. But when my brain and my heart are tracking with God's word and I allow Holy Spirit to be functioning or inputting in my life, it's a done deal. It's a piece of cake. When I go on habits of walking by my flesh, my five senses only, life is, is a crapshoot. It's hit or miss and a lot more chaotic and uncertain. But tonight, we will look at some situations where proper motive is in place and the following results and some situations where motives were horrible, uh, as recorded in God's Word. Specifically, we'll see five places where motive is provided for our understanding in God's Word. And uh, we will begin in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. Uh, so take your your Bibles, and tonight we'll be looking at the REV and be referring to some commentary uh, quite a bit. But First Chronicles chapter 28, we're going to go to verse 9, but I want to start in the, the beginning of the chapter so we get the context of verse 9. In the beginning of First Chronicles chapter 28, you can see just before verse 1 in your in your revised English version, there's a subtitle, and it gives us a, a an idea of the following verses. Uh, and this will be talking about David commissioned Solomon to build the temple. Uh, so the beginning of the chapter starts where David assembled all of the officials of Israel to Jerusalem, the leaders of the tribes and commanders of divisions, commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, and officials over all the property and possessions of the king and of his sons, and with the officers and the mighty men, all the mighty men of valor. So David has, has summoned a lot of people together uh, and is going to give them information about what was on his heart was to build a temple. So in verse 2, David, the king, stood up on his feet and said, Hear me, my brothers and my people. As for me, it was in my heart to build a permanent house for the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh and for the footstool of our God. And I had prepared to build. I was going to do it. Verse 3, But God said to me, You are not to build a house for my name because you are a man of wars and of shed blood. Uh, and Yahweh goes on down, and in verse uh, 
five, he mentions uh, uh, of all my sons, Yahweh's given me, uh, and David had lots of sons. He has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit on the throne of the kingdom of Yahweh that is over Israel. And he said, Solomon, your son will build my house and my courts, for I've chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Um, so verse 8 uh, says, Now therefore in the sight of all Israel, the assembly of Yahweh, Yahweh, and in the audience of our God, keep and search out all the commandments of Yahweh your God, so that you may continue to possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance to your children after you. So here's our verse coming up. Verse 9. You, Solomon, my son, Know the God of your father and serve him with a holy, devoted heart and with a willing mind. For Yahweh searches all hearts and understands every motive of the thoughts. So Yahweh understands every motive of the thoughts. If you search for him, he will be found for you. But if you forsake him, he will abandon you forever. So pretty interesting uh this topic of God understanding every motive of the thoughts. If we look at a King James Version translation, I'll read that to you just so you can see it. it, it, it they don't use the word motive, it's imaginations. Uh, King James reads, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, you'll be found of uh, thee, but if you forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. The new, uh, the American Standard Version uh, for that uh, phrase, it's understandeth all the imagination of the thoughts. The NIV, New International Version, understands every desire and every thought. Darby Translation is, uh, discerns all the imaginations of the thoughts. The Common English Bible uh, renders it, understands the motive behind every thought. The words can change meanings over the years. And in 1511, when King James translation was, was uh, penned, most likely the word imaginations meant something different than it does today. Uh, today, uh, uh, well, I remember my grandmother, who was born in 1902. She used to say at times, uh, I imagine so, which meant probably so or most likely. Uh, uh, however, a word, uh, a definition for the word imagination could be the ability to form mental images of things that are not present to the senses or not considered to be real. So, I don't think that really grasped the meaning of, of this word here in 1 Chronicles 28. The word that, that is used, I think, makes more sense when we use the word motive. So motive can mean an inner drive or feeling that causes a person to do something in a certain way. The noun form of the word is, of course, motivation, and, and we use that word pretty frequently in uh, everyday language, motivation. We're all familiar with that. So let's go to the next uh, location. Let's go to Genesis chapter five. Uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter six. So Genesis chapter six, as you're turning there, this chapter begins uh, in the subheader. It uh, mentions the Nephilim. Uh, and the chapter, we're going to look at... The, verse 5, but before we get there, the context, uh, backing up to verse 1, uh, and when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were desirable, and they took them, and they took for themselves wives of all that they chose. Um, the Nephilim, verse 4, were on the earth in those days, and after this, when the sons of God came in to daughters of men and they bore children, these were the mighty men who were of all the famous men. 
So verse five is our key verse. So Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts, that every intention is the word that was translated motive earlier in First Chronicles. So Yahweh saw that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, continually. So this is not just, uh, this, this was a, an, an unprecedented situation uh, after God had, had formed, made, and created mankind. In verse 6, Yahweh regretted that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. So this was a, a big, big deal. And God was aware that every intention of, of man was terrible. It was evil. It wasn't just uh, some good, some bad, but every intention of man's hearts were evil. And God knew this. God saw this. Um, the next place we're going is, uh, is Deuteronomy 31. So as you turn to Deuteronomy, uh, things had been progressing. Uh, uh, God had had some, there was one man that was righteous in God's eyes, and that was Noah. And God had given Noah information and revelation on what to do. So God was going to save Noah and all of the people whose evil intentions were continuously they were going to be removed from the face of the earth. And there was a reason for that. And that's uh, a, there's a lot of teachings that have been done about that. But in Genesis, uh, excuse me, in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31, sorry. Um, the, the flood has happened. Let's see. I don't think I, did I get to? Yeah. So, the flood has already happened, and uh, all of the events have, have occurred. Uh, mankind is wiped out except for um, Noah and his family, and, and they were saved. And um, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, uh, we, we, we progress with things as they move forward in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 31, uh, we see that, that Joshua is... Uh, being chosen to su succeed Moses. And by this time, Moses was really old. Uh, verse two, he was about, a, he was 120 years old and he was no longer to do the things that he had earlier done as, as, as a younger man. Um, and uh, Yahweh, verse three, said to God, uh, he will cross over before you. Yahweh will cross over before you and he will destroy the nations before you from before you and will dispossess them. And Joshua will cross over before you, just as Yahweh had said. So God is, is choosing another man, a younger man, to lead the uh, children of Israel into the promised land. And it's very clear. So we go down to verse 14, uh, and you can see from the sub header there in the REV that Joshua was commissioned to lead Israel. So verse 14, Yahweh said to Moses, behold, your days approach you that you will die. Uh, call Joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting so that I may commission him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting and Yahweh appeared in the tent and a pillar of cloud and the pillar of the cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. Um, uh, we go on down, a uh, lot of details about that. Uh, I want to get to verse, uh, we'll get, we'll skip down to verse 20. For when I have brought them, children of Israel, into the land that I swore to their fathers, flowing with milk and honey, and they will have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, then they will turn to other gods, wow, and serve them, and treat me with contempt and break my covenant. Wow, just Put yourself in Joshua's shoes. He's getting ready to step in and lead uh, these group of people. And God's telling Moses, here's what's going to happen. So verse 21, then 
when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song will testify against them as a witness, for it will not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know that they are inclined, for I know what they are inclined to do at this present time, even before I have brought them into the land which I swore. So, this motive of heart uh, in verse 18, we'll back up there. Uh, God says, but I, I will hide, yes, hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they have done, because they will have turned to the other gods. With uh, all my might is, is referenced there as, as the, uh, what was translated earlier is motive of heart. Uh, and this motive of heart, David had, uh, everything, everything was put into the situation for the children of, of Israel to move forward. And there's just the motive of heart is really, really messed up with people. There's a lot of evil going on. So it's, it's, it's made apparent that, um, their motives were really messed up. So we've seen evidences of, of motives where they were uh, an intense and thoughts where they were right on and they were done properly. And we've seen situations where motives were not. Um, okay, let's, let's go, let's go to another place uh, back in Chronicles, uh, Chronicles, first Chronicles 29. This will be the last place that we look at this uh, motive. Uh, in First Chronicles uh, 29, uh, there's, uh, of course, contributions for building the temple, as we have looked at earlier, and 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 we know that that uh, Solomon is going to be the the one building the temple. And chapter 29 goes into all of the details that are being brought and and to uh, the the construction of the temple. And and I'm sure David had his hand and and all the people that he had called in earlier. To, to to gather all these materials to build the temple. Uh, and in verse 1, uh, uh, 1 Chronicles 29, David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, the one whom God has chosen is young and tender, and the work is great because the palace is not for a man but for Yahweh. Uh, and now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the gold and the things made of gold and silver and, and lots of lots of details and lots of information here that are going to be presented uh, about how the temple will be constructed and uh, and uh, built. But we go down to verse eighteen, <clears throat> and this is an interesting uh, situation here. Um, We'll, we'll go back to verse 17. So verse 17 in 1 Chronicles 29 says, I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. As for me and the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. Now I have seen with joy your people that are present here offer willingly to you. Verse 18, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this motive in the heart of your people forever and direct their heart toward you and give to Solomon, my son, an undivided heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies. So the motive of heart of your people was, was to be toward God. So there was great insight into understanding God knows people's motives, and God wanted people's motives to be pure. When they, in other words, the the thoughts behind why they were doing things, behind their actions, God wanted them to be pure. Um, and and David was certainly a, a wonderful, great man. He was a, a man after God's own heart. Let's let's go to Psalm one thirty nine, and and we'll see some of God's perspective of of David. Um, who had a, a wonderful heart. It wasn't perfect. Obviously, uh, we're aware of the things that David did that uh, 
uh, with Bathsheba and then the involvement of Uriah being uh, being killed. Um, but David is the only person that I'm aware of in the Word of God where it says that he was a man after God's own heart. So David's motives, why he thought the things he thought, why he the actions that he did, most of the time, those motives were were clearly in alignment and harmony with God. Uh, verse 1 of Psalm 139, uh, and this is a psalm of, of David, O Yahweh, you have searched me and known me, for you for you, you yourself know when I sit down and when I stand up. You discern what I think from afar. So David knew that, that God knew his heart, knew his mind. Uh, Verse three, you measure out where I go and when I rest. Yes, you are acquainted with all my road. For an utterance does not have to be on my tongue. Behold, O Yahweh, you know it all together. So David had a really clear understanding of, of God's understanding of him. And, uh, and it uh, states in uh, Acts, Acts, you don't have to turn there, but Acts 13 22 uh, uh, says, and when he had removed him, Saul, God raised up David to be their king. And he also testified about him and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. And of course, that is referring back to uh, 1 Samuel 13, 14, uh, where it states, Yahweh has sought for himself a man after his heart. And Yahweh has commanded him to be ruler over his people uh, because Saul, you have not kept Yahweh what has commanded you. Let's go to uh, Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs certainly give a lot of, of great insight into, into living and, and about how to take care of our thinking our, and our minds and our hearts. And uh, Proverbs Four, twenty-three states more than anything else. More than anything else, you protect, and we protect a lot of things in our lives. Uh, we protect our homes. We protect our automobiles. Uh, uh, if you have a garden, you probably protect that from uh, animals that would like to to consume part of your garden before you eat it. So, more than anything else, you protect. Guard your heart because from it, from the heart, flow the issues of life. And there's great information here uh, in the commentary about, uh, about, about this. Uh, see, I get down to the portion uh, that I wanted to share with you. From the RV commentary, uh, the great gatekeeper of the heart is the mind. Things get into our hearts through our mind, which is why it is so important to watch what you see, what we see and hear and control our thoughts. Uh, Philippians 4, 8 says to think about things that are true, pure, righteous, etc. Uh, peace is also one of the is one of the guards that watches over our hearts. It's also vital to control our actions, uncontrolled actions only reinforce any anger or evil that is already in us. That is one reason why self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit. So, so yeah, man basically, uh, it, you know, a lot of the world teaches that man is basically good. God's Word does not say that man is basically good. God's Word says that man is, is basically evil. And, and, and if we put ourselves in autopilot or, or allow things of the world to influence us without having our minds focused on God and his word and, and, and seeking God's help and by way of Holy Spirit operating in our lives, then a lot of times our motives can be just when we're on autopilot, it can be the things that are around us, our our environment that tends to influence us more so than God and his word. So our actions can, and our motives can, can be basically shaped by the things of the world and not by the things of God and his word. 
So at times it can it can it can be important to sort of do a you've heard this term before do a checkup from the neck up. So we can kind of think, well, why am I doing this this action here? Why am I thinking this? And sometimes it helps us to put the reins on and we can change what we're thinking about or why we're thinking it and make sure that our minds and our hearts are tracking with God and his word. It can keep us out of harm's way and it can help us to be a, a better uh, impact on the people around us and, and can allow us to do what we need to be doing in the body of Christ. So let's uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I want to conclude here in Ephesians chapter 2. We'll look in verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, the word states, For by grace you have been saved through trust. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a re result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his handiwork. We are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance so that we would walk in them. So in order to do good works, maintaining our hearts and our motives pure, it's important in our lives as we live our lives for our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We simply cannot put things on autopilot. We cannot allow the distractions of the world to be the main influence in our thoughts and in our decisions as children of God. We want to do our, our very best for our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us so that we can live pleasing lives for our God. So let's make our Father proud of us in our day-to-day -day activities as we live our lives in service to our mighty Father, Yahweh. Thank you for your attention as we maintain our lives pure and as we maintain our motives in alignment and harmony with God and his word.